Well, hello. Um, I'm Dr. Carlo O'Regan. I chair the criminology department here at St. Thomas University. And on behalf of the department, the president, and the board of trustees for the endowed chair in criminology and criminal justice, it is my pleasure to welcome you here to St. Thomas University, which sits on the traditional and unceded territory of the Lewistiqui people, who along their ancestors with the Passamaquoddy and the Mi'kmaq signed peace and friendship treaties here in the 1700s. Many of you, however, come from other traditional territories. And so this moment is really an opportunity for widespread reflection of our use of these lands and our ongoing obligation to make real the promise of truth and reconciliation. Reflecting on the experiences of racialized communities lies at the heart of our work here tonight. And frankly, it's not easy work. Rarely is work that is worth doing. However, it is work worth doing. So we are immensely grateful in this moment of reflection and inviting empathetic reflection to welcome our elder in residence, Meg Mahan, who's going to share some thoughts that help us both in opening and closing tonight's discussion. So please welcome me in inviting and welcoming Meg Mahan to the stage. Um, I uh, brought uh, my helpers, uh, spiritual uh, helpers, uh, this evening to help help us uh, create space in, on this very important dialogue. And um, I will uh, also light some medicines just to. Um, uh, bring us, bring all our energy uh, together, uh, ground us, and uh, uh, ref uh, help us to open and reflect uh, how we want to be together as we move forward uh, in our human lives in relations to each other and to all that we are dependent on, which is the the natural world, and which is the source of our lives that sustain us all. So I have a representation from uh, the eagle, which is very important in our culture as our spiritual, uh, the eagle teaches us spiritual sight and uh, to fly ab a high above to be able to see a wider lens of our communities and how uh, we want to live together. So. And the sage that I brought tonight is to uh, uh, calm our energy, uh, open our minds and heart, and um, support uh, each other and uh, how uh, what what the discussions are going to be about this evening. So I will uh, offer thanksgiving, acknowledge our work, uh, acknowledge all of you, your um, ancestors, and here on uh, coming together uh, here on campus, and all that that's happening here at St. Thomas University. Conversations that are moving all of us, and we've arrived here uh, to contribute to how we, what we want to bring home, what we want in our lives, and what we want to create for our communities and our future families and um, life on our sacred mother.
I have offered thanksgiving on our behalf that uh, to remember why we've returned in these times and that uh, we've We, in in our in in the indigenous culture, we've always understood that our relationship to land and to water to the waters and our relationship to the to the spiritual realm that we call our ancestors or our uh, spiritual elders who've passed on and uh, the creator creators uh, as a collective we. Um, pride ourselves in, in non-interference in the human development of all people, that we all, we all hold the wisdom, we all carry knowledge, and that we all know uh, what is good for, and what good for us. And so uh, we, every, we all have a, a right responsibility and a freedom uh, to to be and that's the relationship individual relationship we all have with our own creator and how in our own communities and so in my language I acknowledge that um, that no human being um, can control another without uh, experiencing um, uh, and, uh, some form of uh, conflict. So it's to build, rebuild our communities and rebuild the trust and good relations of uh, how we, how our ancestors all lived uh, right in a right, rightful way, in a right relations with all life that we honor the flow of the river, uh, the growth of the grass, and uh, the clarity of, of the sky and our sacred mother, and that if we try and navigate and control her, we are now experiencing the results of our uh, lack of trust and control onto the great, onto the great fo life force. And now we are also experiencing that in our own communities. So uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity to open a space of dialogue and that we all feel comfortable and feel free to be able to express ourselves. Thank you, Mi'kmaq Mahan.
just a few um, administrative items. <laughs> One is that um, we do, the university does ask that you're masked in indoor common space. We do have masks available outside on the tables, should you need one. Uh, the washrooms are also just as you exit here um, to your right. So if you haven't found those already, they are there. Uh, finally, when we, we will have a question and answer period, um, it'll be after the end of all three of our speakers. Um, I'll open the floor for questions and answers, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and we're going to ask you to come down to either of these two mics at the end of the aisles. It's important that you do that, although um, as an Irish descendant, I have a rather large voice. I rarely need amplification, but it does help with the recording of the event, uh, just so that everyone can hear your question, and then we have it on there as well for posterity. So. Give it some thought now, those students out there, the, these great questions you're going to ask at the end. Um, all right, so uh, to get things started, um, I'm going to invite um, Tondaway McCarthy to come up and give us a poetry presentation. Tondaway is a writer, a spoken word poet, and a seventh generation black Canadian. His essays exploring his black identity were published by the Nova Scotia Advocate, and in 2020, he performed his poetry at the Fry Festival. As a community advocate, he co-founded the New Brunswick Black Artist Alliance and helped to republish the book, The Blacks of New Brunswick. His memoir, Social Oblivion, Raised Black in Canada, was published earlier this year. Please join me in welcoming Tondaway to the stage. Hello? Oh, good. This is definitely on. Yes, I'm going to do uh, two poems uh, to start off because my mentor said to uh, go wild. So this one starting off is called The uh, One Black Poet, and it is my introduction poem. To be or not to be, the blackness that is part of me. To champion cultures quietly or sing its virtues filled with glee. It seems the choice is not with me. For I am black because you see this hair I choose a careful key. This skin that yells what culture be on any known reality. It's plain the blackness inside me. But what of names I shall not tease, but share intimately, like birds and bees. The one black poet needs no decree. My presence speaks quite well for me. Just scan this room if you would seek the accuracy my title speaks. The conversations it won't let sleep of visual minorities, of those most extraordinary, chained in burdens less than merry, cloaked in blindness we all carry. It's why my voice can seem so scary. I will not hide so I can be that one black poet you all now see. This next one is called Defund the Police. <laughs> Defund the Police is just a sound, an alarm clock that wakes you up to the realization that things are not okay. Like, for instance, the New Brunswick government is currently bragging of a $700 million surplus, and the city of Fredericton is planning to build a $32 million prison, all while the cost of living rises, causing more hardworking humans to go homeless. Yet when I say defund the police, you call me nuts. Defund the police 
is an emotional lure that you bite so that we may drag you out of that ocean of comfort and compliance. The truth that is the reality of our situation. The threat is so great that even conversations on police funding are mere distractions. For every person in New Brunswick is under assault, from gas prices, to hospital services, to educational standards, to long-term care, to even our food costs. What, do you think the fact that New Brunswick didn't have policies to prevent this was just bad luck? Or oh, maybe the Fredericton police needs a bigger armored truck. We are sick, we are starving, and we are without shelter, and yet that is where all of us has chosen to spend 300000 And yet when I say defund the police, you call me nuts. Well, the data is in. Ask any criminologist. Time and time again, it's been proven that prisons are shit. And those that walk in, walk out more likely to commit. You see, it's prisons that make humans more dangerous. Because it's love and respect that they never get. Inside, they are beaten and screamed at for years, then released to a world told to view them with fear. So that cycle of exclusion and survival begins once again as the trauma they faced while well, inside that prison. And that monster truck we bought for the Fredericton police gets to breathe a $300,000 sigh of relief. For as long as there's prisons, there's wounded souls for cops to beat. And as long as we build that $32 million prison, sexual assault victims will be sent home, told not to pee. Welfare checks will turn into murders that get swept under the streets. Chantel Moore, Rodney Levi, and the many more that don't make it to our TVs. Yet when I say defund the police, you call me crazy. Defund the police is the candy-coated cartoon compared to the systemic spiritual and societal issues we face. We are chopping down trees into apartments priced beyond all our means. The cost of living is so high you can have two jobs and still remain homeless. Migrants are moving to this province with no place to live. The hospitals are refusing service to rape victims. They send the suicidal home to die. New Brunswick children have some of the highest rates of illiteracy. And we are in the middle of our greatest mental health emergency. How can a $32 million prison help with anything that I have just said? What, do we need more armored trucks to carry the homeless into prison beds? Why does our government brag of a $700 million surplus when depressed women are sent away from our hospitals only to be later found dead? Can't you see everything but the police has been defunded? For a have-not province, we sure have an abundance of prisons. Where are our teachers? Where are our nurses? Where are our local clinics? Who have we trusted to prevent these conditions? When all your government money goes to punishment, it's hard to see your dignity and health be well represented. And yet these are the profits our wealthy prison system makes. But I ask, has anyone here voted for how things have turned out today? It seems like pouring money into police is investing in pain because we keep getting harmed while they keep getting paid. And you can all call me crazy, but I ask, when's the last time New Brunswick has spent millions in love to heal our communities? 
What has really been defunded? Fredericton, New Brunswick, please answer me. Way that should get us started. <laughs> so the endowed chair in criminology and criminal justice is, um, well, it's a large endowment that was given to the university specifically to provide uh, students with the opportunity to hear from researchers in the field uh, doing specialized work, um, to expose our students to that work. Uh, to create opportunities and forums like this for public discussion of these specialized issues, and also to invite our community, um, community members and stakeholders as well to participate in some of those discussions. Um, we select the endowed chair years before they actually arrive, um, and it's a rather, uh, well, we read many applications, and the department was particularly thrilled when Dr. Suleiman Giwa applied. He has an extensive background, particularly for our criminology students in applied work. Um, he has worked, for instance, as a community parole officer at an indigenous healing lodge. He's also been a case manager for um, youth gang exit programs. Um, but his day job <laughs> is as an associate professor and associate dean of social work at Memorial University. He has extensive research in the policing field, um, having consulted with both RCMP as well as provincial and municipal police forces. He sat down at the table during his term here at St. Thomas with the Fredericton Police Force, which his students that took his defunding the police course had the opportunity to do with him. So in many ways, he is a model example for us of um, endowed chairs that expose our students as well as our wider community to these incredibly important discussions. He has curated this evening, having selected all of the presenters. And so without further ado, I'm gonna welcome to the uh, him to the stage. He will provide some remarks and as well introduce our keynote speaker. So Dr. Sulin Giwa. Thank you so much for that uh, warm welcome. Good evening. Bonsoir tout le monde. Ekale, which in my mother tongue language in Yoruba means good evening. It is great to share this space with all of you tonight. I've been at St. Thomas University for the past three months as the endowed chair in criminology and criminal justice. I've had the great pleasure of teaching and meeting many amazing people who are doing incredible things to promote social justice and also to make the kind of world we need, deserve, and want to live in. Two of these amazing and talented people, Mr. Tendui McCarthy and Dr. Al Jones, are here with me tonight. I, and I think Tendui and Elm would agree. We stand on the shoulders of giants who have paved the way for each of us to do the work we do. While we may not always agree on how we get to the same place, we are all committed to making the world a place where everyone can be there themselves, free from all forms of state and non-state violence, harm, and injustice. The public killing of George Floyd by a white Minneapolis police officer in the summer of 2020 sparked a movement unprecedented since the civil rights movement of the 1960s. This was not a one country movement but rather a global movement to change how the police institution treats members of the public who are black, indigenous, or people of color. We've all heard the rallying cry, defund the police. At its heart, the intentions of the movement are grounded in a reality where two justice systems exist, one for the white and the wealthy, and the other for people who are from indigenous and racialized communities. For too long, we have seen disparities in who is arrested for drug crimes. For too long, we have seen the negative effects of mass incarceration. For too long, 
we have seen racial disparities in fatal police violence and shootings. The intersections of this ongoing and longstanding community well-being and safety issue, combined with George Floyd's public execution, created a perfect storm for the current call to defund the police and also to abolish the police. Yet, defunding the police is an idea whose implications are not fully understood and the future we are being asked to envision, one in which the police are defunded or abolished, raises more questions than it answers. Today, I want to expose some of those questions. I also want to explore the implications of what we mean when we say defund the police. And I want to propose some alternative ideas, some alternative slogans that may reach the goals that collectively we share. I also want to be clear about several things. One, we can't debate in slogans. Two, we can't have conversations in slogans. And three, we can't move forward with just slogans. Instead, we must ask tough questions, engage in conversations with intellectual humility and curiosity, and conduct the necessary research which is currently lacking. My goal is not to take any side in this conversation, but to instead provide context and provoke rigorous debate. So my first question, can shifting resources away from police help to address long-standing injustices and disparities in the criminal justice system? Imagine a police force in a rural community whose resources are already stretched thin. What would defunding do to that police force and its ability to investigate and solve crimes? In fact, in a 2022 research paper, Professor Lam, Cooper, and Wu found that minority and underfunded communities wanted more, not less policing. Why, you may ask. They wanted the crimes tearing their communities apart to be solved. Corner Federstorff makes a similar argument in an Atlantic article where he advocates, and I apologize for using the slogan, instead of defund the police, how about solve all murders? In addition, defunding the police does not always address the entirety of the criminal justice system itself, a system made up of private interest in prisons, prosecutors, and also judges. Courts, both in the United States and Canada, are already backlogged. How would decreasing their funding speed up justice for anyone? One might argue that the court and the prosecutors should divert funds from minor drug crimes and small offenses and instead focus more on violent behavior. That is a fair point. But the rallying cry should be rebalancing, not defund the police. My second question, what evidence suggests that community programs and organizations are better equipped to undo a significant portion of the calls for service currently ended by police. For example, mental health crisis calls where community programs are co-responders with police. According to the same American research I mentioned earlier, the researchers looked at 911 call data and found that mental health issues were a small number of cases that police responded to. In addition, the researchers note as well that those community programs and organizations may want to a police presence for protection if the situation turns violent. That is not to minimize the severity of the issue or the dignity of those involved. But what about the calls that community organizations aren't equipped to handle? Community programs and organizations can investigate crimes or arrest people. They don't have the technology or databases of or informant systems that police have. Outside of mental health crisis, who else is going to investigate and apprehend murderers, rapists, domestic abusers? My third question, are community-based policing alternatives free of structural flaws identified in other systems being advocated for defunding and or abolition? If community-based alternative, excuse me, if community-based policing alternatives follow the laws and policies of Canadian society 
and they interact with our court system, how would they be a better alternative when some of the same unconscious and conscious biases can creep up, creep into how they perform their work? We need more research around this question, but it is a question that is not being asked yet. We must be brave enough to ask questions, tough questions, even of the most well-intentioned of individuals, groups, and organizations. My fourth question, is meaningful community investment only feasible if police funding is cut? Can police exist concurrently with public investment in community-based initiatives? Are these two concepts mutually exclusive, exclusive or can they coexist? We are seeing an uptick of co-responder models where community organizations, especially ones involved in mental health, can respond with the police to the situation. Could social workers be nest in responding with police? What about teachers when juveniles are involved? What about addiction counselors when drugs are involved? There are ways to involve our community members with the police. Once we can help address the root causes of the problem caused by the accused, could this model be a path forward? One thing is for sure. These approaches will necessitate more funding, not less. Question five, where can both sides find common ground? Solving crimes, stopping violence, good community relationships. Police want all of these things too. So do the people who want to defund them. Use of force has nothing to do with money. Bad cops should not be protected by powerful police unions. Will violent crimes go down if we cut the funding to police departments? Logic and reason say no. Imagine a teacher in a classroom that doesn't enforce any rules. Will the children magically start behaving? On the flip side, a draconian teacher doesn't produce a fruitful learning environment. There must be a happy middle. If police are defunded, can we ensure that the money saved will go towards the community organizations who are likely underfunded? There are structural issues at play that defunding the police won't address. Even so, will these organizations be able to fill the void left by the police, by the defunded police department? So what is the path forward? We must ask, how do we prevent violent crimes from happening in the first place? How do we more effectively investigate the violent crimes that do happen? Do the police need more money in that area? For example, many rape test kits go untested, which leads to many rapists never being held accountable for their actions. It doesn't take any money for community organizations and police to work together. Just a will and a need from both. The police are just one part of the criminal justice system. Do we defund courts? and prosecutors too? Or do we give them more resources which could be shared by the police? The police don't make the laws. Sure, some would argue that they selectively enforce certain ones against poor and marginalized people. But that is a bias and not one that can be addressed through funding or defunding. Instead, we have to look at changing the laws through the legislative process in order to effect change such as reducing penalties for nonviolent drug use or providing more resources for those struggling with addictions? How do we stop police from unnecessary acts of violence against accused individuals? Defunding is just one stick. It all comes back to the legislature where we need to pass laws that allow police officers to be held accountable for their actions rather than the typical qualified immunity. How do we move from this debate forward? Research is hard to do. We can't experiment by cutting a budget and seeing what happens. That would be a reckless, that would be reckless. Imagine if murderers, rapes, and domestic violence all increase. It would be a sick human experiment. Instead, we must address the issues that defund the police wants to address, but not in a way of removing money and resources. Laws are unequally applied that requires a change in the unconscious bias of prosecutors, judges, and lawmakers. Police officers use unjustifiable deadly force, change the laws to make them accountable, and seek justice each and every time. 
which will also necessitate resources to do well. Not all crimes are investigated fairly. More reporting, statistics, and ensuring evidence-based policing strategies can ensure a greater level of accountability of the police force. Instead of defund the police, why don't we try a different slogan, backed up by research and common ground, ones whose goals may match those of the police and the marginalized and racialized communities who have been hit hardest by over-policing? Why not, as Conor Fridesorf suggests in his Atlantic article, solve all murders? Why not change the laws? Why not change the judges? And why not change the lawmakers? Let us commit to an open and rigorous debate on the issue of over-policing, including, as Corner Friderstorff suggested, the injustice of under-policing, which will inevitably result as a form of oppression if police are to be defunded. Thank you. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Al Jones. Dr. Jones is a poet, journalist, professor, and activist living in Halifax. She teaches at Mount St. Vincent University where she was named the Nancy's Chair in Women's Studies in 2017. Her work focuses on social justice issues such as feminism, prison abolition, anti-racism, and decolonization. In Abolitionist Intimacies, her latest book, she examines the history of prisons in Canada in their relationships to settler colonialism and anti-black racism. Copies of these books will be available for purchase at the, after the lecture. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Jones. Good evening, peace everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, thank you to Tan Dewe for that beautiful opening. Um, I just give him another round of applause. I'm so, I'm like glowing with pride to see you on this stage. Just an amazing poet, and please look out for his work. And thank you, Dr. Giwa, for putting this all together, and also for reminding us that these are very difficult and complex topics, and as we engage with them, we can't be afraid of the hard questions. We can't shy away from asking ourselves um, to really challenge not just the police force, but all the ideologies behind policing that rest in so many institutions. And you put that... Uh, throughout what you were saying is that um, the police are only one institution. We have to be willing to engage critically and carefully and with great complexity in all different institutions as well. So thank you for asking us those questions as we begin. Uh, you've done some hard work. I get to do a bit easier work because I'm going through poetry and storytelling as well. Um, but we do have time in the Q&A if we want to get into um, some of the more theoretical work and questioning about some of the ins and outs on my view on abolition and defunding. So that's just all my ungraceful intro material. And then I'm going to start from here. I know a man who stabbed a man inside and got sent off to the shoe. But he says, when somebody comes after you, then what else do you do? I don't believe that he's a monster. But that's what the system say. And now he's doing double life and might not see the light of day. And when you're 15 and your family teaches you to sell crack, well, is there any coming back? So you grow to manhood in the max. And we define entire lives by a person's worst acts, so we just list their various crimes and believe we have the facts. So here's another story of another lost defendant. He's 20 years old and he's eight years into his sentence. Brought over to the prison from juvenile detention, sometimes children in this country just don't deserve a mention until they commit a crime and then suddenly we pay attention. There are people in society we label as disposable. When you're already doing time, shouldn't be the first time you're diagnosable and so we put them in a prison where at least they are controllable. And I suppose it isn't notable. And no one gets emotional. Unless we find out that they're innocent, then maybe humanity's negotiable. But for the rest, you did the crime. So your humanity's ignored. And men are in so long they don't know how to use a door. 
And men are in so long, they never heard of Internet Explorer. That's what happens when you're black, when you're indigenous or poor, when you're considered to be criminal before you're even born. I get an incoherent call at 3 o'clock in the morning. The same guy who called me crying to report he was assaulted, he says he's locked up in his room, surrounded by guns and knives. If they come to take him back, it's either his or their lives. He said ever since he left the prison, he's been numbing with a high that people say to close his mouth because it doesn't happen to real guys. I suppose it's ironic. He's from the same reserve as Donald Marshall. So it seems to me that justice there was only ever partial. When we look back at that case and say those 11 years were awful, but for everybody else, the same suffering is lawful. I've heard so many tragic stories, I could almost tick off a box, but still we call it justice once the prison doors are locked. We believe that punishment comes to the people who deserve it, but punishment mostly comes to the people who can't swerve it, can't avoid it, can't employ it, can't voice it, can't afford it, and then once you go to prison, whatever happens, can't report it. So we talk about wrongful. But what are the rightful convictions? Sure, there's Paul Bernardo, Clifford Olson, Robert Picton. But what about the man on his 50th charge of shoplifting when it's obvious to everyone the problem is addiction and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission can only be a fiction as long as indigenous people are still filling up the prison? I have a hard time seeing justice as a reserve without a well, but then we bring its children a smudge kit in their cell. Don't we wonder what will happen when there's foster kids living in hotels or black children in the principal's office five minutes past the bell because they never learned to read and they fell between the gaps. We start with zero tolerance by the time they're done taking naps. Is it justice when some people start the race ahead by laps in a country where we can't even guarantee clean water from the taps and there's indigenous land under under every prison on the map. And as you move up from minimum to medium to max, it's a funny thing in Canada how the skin just gets more black. And that lack of access to parole that is kind of like a tax, a couple years of extra sentence that they tack onto our backs and there's those weapons laws they pass that they claim are for the gangs. While there's white supremacists in prison with KKK upon their hands and there's guards who give them death. And the police can gun down teenagers and never hit the stand. I won't even get into asking why we never charge the banks. But should anyone be sent to where they have to carry shanks? I watched police roll into Ferguson with snipers riding tanks. I don't believe you have to not have done it for justice to be miscarried when I've known men so long in prison that their babies now are married. Hell, I've known men so long in prison they first meet their son out on the range and I don't know that it is justice if we decide you can never change. And I don't know that it is justice when there's men inside a cage and I don't know that it is justice if the scales will never budge and men in prison with so much legal knowledge they could be a judge. And maybe they could have gone in that direction if they only got a nudge. And it's true, I have known men who did a killing for a grudge. But does three seconds of your life make you only human sludge? And let's not talk about the corporations that profit off it all, like the predatory phone companies gouging prisoners for a call, women going broke when her man's conviction's not her fault. I could talk about the scanners and how many hits are false. Families turned away after driving up for hours because I don't know that it is justice when it's so easy to abuse powers. I could talk to you for days. It would all be the same ruin, and I know men who did their time down in prison with us soon, but they'll never be set free to share their voices in these rooms and I know lawyers, guards, and judges who do their best to change the tune. But in a society that's broken, that's like reaching for the moon. And I confess, I once believed that every person could be saved. And it took a couple of years, and it's true that I got played, and I had to face it. There's some people who seem to want to dig a grave. 
but I still don't believe that they deserve solitary just because they misbehaved, and I still believe we can do better, and we have to find a way. And I'd still rather know I tried, even if it means I failed, because it never will be justice. Well, our solution still is jail. So from the people doing time in Kent, down to people in Renews, from the people in the county, up to people in the shoe, if that was your life story, what do you think you'd do? Thank you, Abby. So that's a poem that came from the lifers. Um, and one of the things I really appreciated about Dr. Giwa's talk is he really challenged us to take on the complexities of these systems, to ask ourselves hard questions. And one of the things I'm trying to do in this book is to capture some of these stories, but also some of the difficulties and challenges of doing this work as well. Um, so I'm going to do one more poem, and then I'm going to read a little bit out of the book and tell you a little bit of the story. So this poem actually came from the Black and Indigenous lifers who asked me to do a poem about juries and their experiences of juries. And then I'm going to read you a little bit out of the book. So when I say, my friend walked into court under the portrait of a queen in this poem, that is referring to my friend Randy Riley, who is currently facing a wrongful conviction. So I'm going to read you a little bit about his story out of the book to follow. And I'm going to do some more reading. Um, and so this is in the context. I guess maybe I'll explain really briefly. I kind of gave you a snapshot of what the book is. Um, the idea behind the title is a fancy title, Abolitionist Intimacies. It just means freedom and love. But uh, perhaps more complexly, the idea is that we experience what I call carceral intimacies, which is notions of forced proximity or forced uh, touch and closeness that take place under the state. So in prison, that might be things like the strip search, the control of visits, the surveillance of phone calls, the rules on how many boxes you can pack for people. During COVID, of course, people experience the deathly proximity of prisons as a literal petri dish for disease. So those are carceral intimacies. And against that is what I call abolitionist intimacies, which is all of our moves of love, mutual care, and resistance that try to challenge that. So packing extra in the prison box, the phone calls that we make with people that we love, refusing not to love those in prison, those who continue to co-parent with those behind walls, and all the other acts of care that we take outside community in order to try and find new ways to rethink punishment, accountability, healing, and these other difficult questions. So that's kind of the idea behind the book, told through a lot of voices of people in prison. Now I gave you that, now I'll do this poem, and then I'll read you some from the book. Okay, so um, this poem is called White Juries, and it comes from the guys behind the bars. <laughs> One white, two white, three white jurors. Four white, five white, six white jurors. Ten white, eleven white, twelve white jurors. It's an all-white jury again. Gerald Stanley walked out of the courtroom a free man. Shots fired through the window of an SUV. He said he was just defending his land a hang fire. He said, just a twitch of his hand. The life of Colton Bushy, worth less than the alleged theft of an ATV. What was he doing was all they debated on TV. Shots to the head while he was lying there asleep. And so the indigenous youth was the only one found guilty. And there were comments that he deserved it in a secret Facebook group for the RCMP and a group of Saskatchewan farmers. Of course, they all agreed. And the publishing companies offered him an exclusive book deal and the jury pool. <laughs> the jury pool. It didn't look like me. And there were hundreds of thousands of dollars donated to his GoFundMe. Oh, Canada, where indigenous lives still fetch a bounty for one little, two little, three little. Raymond Cormier walked into court and walked out. Killing an indigenous girl equals reasonable doubt. The only person on trial was Tina Fontaine. The Globe and Mail headline said there were drugs and booze in her veins. The cops had her to stop and they waved her on through. Just like police asked Colton Bushy's mother if she was drunk when they delivered the news and the jury pool. The jury pool, it didn't look like you. And while Stanley and Cormier are free as a bird, 
Adam Capay was held four years in solitary until the time blurred. By the time the ombudsman got to him, he was slurring his words. They said they forgot him or what even occurred. They say that's an accident, but haven't you heard? In federal prisons, indigenous women make up far more than one third. And over half of the juvenile facilities and the majority in care who are taken from their families and just take a walk through maximum security or take a look round remand and who can't afford the surety. And they locked Renee Ackaby away into obscurity, but then they tell me white is the equivalent of purity. And since we can't be innocent, we should bow to their authority. We can't win. We can't win. Not when session is in. Not with histories upon histories of savages and sin. If you'll all rise to the jury, the court will begin selecting one white, two white, all white jury. You can dress as sexy Pocahontas if you want for Halloween. And Brad Barden was acquitted of murder in the first degree, while Cindy Gladue's vagina was displayed in court for all to see. John Wayne is still an icon of the silver screen. Birth of a nation's been a blockbuster since 1915, and there's gated community where black folk aren't ever seen. When they stop us on the street, they say, that's just routine, and my friend walked into court under a portrait of the queen. Well, I tried to buy him suits while the cop showed up in jeans. We worried he'd look guilty if he wasn't cut so clean. They couldn't show any evidence to even place him at the scene when it came time to read the verdict. You all know what I mean, thanks to one white, two white, all white jury. And the media, well, they said from his face they just knew he couldn't feel. And now the system tells him that perhaps he can appeal. But on the appeals court, there's one white, two white, three white judges. We can't win, we can't win, not once they see a black skin. And once the door locks, no one can see what happens within. They claim you can try a habeas in court, but then the institution spins. And who'll believe a criminal and what they have to say? And now my friend's been there on lockdown for 23 hours a day. And the phone calls only come when your family can pay. When they have you down in SEG, the phone doesn't come around at all. My other friend broke his leg, and for weeks he had to crawl, and a third's been on a hunger strike three weeks behind those walls. They spent money on more weapons, getting the guards some pepper balls. We claw our way into the halls of justice, but our voice is just too small. We can get one or two more judges, but they still write the laws. A guy tried to slit his throat, and they just wrapped him up with gauze. They released a woman to the bus stop in the winter and said, that's just protocol. Just like Neil Stonechild and those prairie starlight tours. And there's another woman, another woman who set herself on fire. But when you die in a prison in my province, no one has to inquire. No charges pressed for guards who watch Ashley Smith expire. But when prisoners hit the stand, it's them they call the liars. Andrew Loku, shot by the police in 21 seconds. Freddy Villanueva executed because police said they felt threatened. Sammy Yatim, shot on a streetcar when he'd already dropped his weapon. But if a cop guns down a black man, he never has to reckon. We can't win. We can't win. The not guilty verdict is in. Because it's one white, two white, three white jurors. Four white, five white, six white jurors. 10 white, 11 white, 12 white jurors. It's an all white jury again. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're getting to the prose part of the book. So as I said, that tells part of the story of Randy Riley. So Randy Riley is an African Nova Scotian man um, who's been in a long odyssey through the justice system. Uh, he was originally convicted in 2018, but before that he was in prison for four or five years awaiting trial. So overall it's been more than a decade. Um, and I actually alluded it to a poem, there wasn't a lot of evidence in his case. Uh, it's now turned out that the witness has retracted his statement and said that he was essentially threatened into making it and told, you can either be the witness in this case or you can be the suspect, you decide. And he decided. He was paid $17,000. Uh, which was not revealed in court, even though the Crown knew about that. Um, and the Crown actually buried disclosure in the files that only came out later. So it's a case that exemplifies a lot of corruption. Um, this is all in my opinion, by the way, because he hasn't yet been exonerated, so I suppose I have to say allegedly to all of this. 
But uh, at this point in the book, so this is towards the end of the book, and it's an essay called Still Not Freedom. And at this point, I actually thought Randy would be facing an October trial. That has not been the case. He actually has still not come to trial. And in fact, it's now in court whether or not um, he'll, they'll stay the charges because he's over the Jordan rule. So if you wait too long to come to trial, you have a right for a speedy trial. And because of delays on the case on the Crown side, they're actually going to be over dates by the time they're able to come to court. So now that's being debated. So there's a whole series of different events going on in this case. I tell many of them through the book. This is towards the end of the book. And I will say that part of the point of this section, so the essay Still Not Freedom is trying to think about um, really what happens when we stop relying on punishment, what community looks like in that context, and also some of the problems of thinking through what does freedom really mean for us. So this is from the end of the essay in the middle. I'm not there when Randy gets out. There's so much delay. First, after his appeal at the Supreme Court, the Crown tries to remove his lawyer from the case. So that delays bail for a couple of months while they fight the removal. Then, when we make it to the bail hearing, the Crown gives everyone a hard time, grilling us on the stand, calling his cousin's landlord to find out if she lives in public housing and if they're aware Randy is charged with murder. They claim she's violating the housing rules by offering for him to live with her. Randy feels like he'll be an imposition on his aunt, but it's obvious she wants him. Then there's the monitoring anklet, which has to be programmed from Colorado and transported from Toronto, and which costs $600 to install, and there's only one technician to install it, and that's three hours away from the jail. We hoped he'd be out for his birthday, but that comes and goes. We remake plans. Finally, a couple of weeks after the decision to release him on bail, the anklet arrives. It's late at night, and he can't leave without his sureties, so they drive to the jail two hours away to get him. On the way home, they stop at a Burger King. Randy orders two bacon double cheeseburgers without the bacon. He's Muslim. Everybody laughs at this. Boy, you must have been in prison too long. When Randy calls to tell me he's out, at first I don't recognize his voice. I've become so used to how it sounds filtered through the prison phone. Voices sound crisper, cleaner in freedom. But of course, this is still not freedom. I get to Randy's aunt's house in the historical black community of Cherry Brook, right when they're leaving to go visit his mother's grave. We drive toward the church, but Randy's family lives all along the road on the way. We have to keep stopping, going into homes, greeting elderly aunts and cousins. It's a slow procession like the Stations of the Cross or a pilgrimage. Each stop, another blessing. Reconnecting with the land, with the generations of his ancestors upon it. Reconstituting life, reforming and remaking. Such an appropriate prelude to visiting the dead, to first honor the living. A reminder that we are still here and we persist. Then the graveyard, anchor of history in the community. His mother's grave never visited until now. A marker, not of death, but of generations in this place, from this place. Another blessing for people dislocated and dispersed, to be close to one's dead. I will never be buried beside my ancestors here in this far-flung country. Where my mother's bones go, I will follow. To walk upon this earth, in this community, and to draw near to the past, a ritual of completion. And after the graveyard, there is the kitchen, with family coming in and out. Men bring clothes, disclaiming the act of shopping for another man, but they went to the mall anyway. Since Randy has gone, pants have gotten tighter. We laugh at his skepticism. Then there is pleasure at his appearance. Clean, fresh, new, remade. The kitchen, place of life and nourishment, filling us filling us with joy. And in the middle of the back and forth and the laughter and the jokes and the noise all overflowing, his cousin pauses. We made it out, he says. And again, we made it out. And I think, isn't that the black condition summed up? 
and it feels poignant for a moment. But this is not the time for reflection. No, not now. Not surrounded by living, breathing, touching, speaking life. But of course, there is later. When Randy tells me how his anklet is rubbed raw by his ankle put on too tightly, and in the telling, connects the wounds on his ankle with the enslaved ankles rubbed raw by shackles. He asks, is it 1821 or 2021? The blistering is made worse by the heat and the sun. Freedom for Randy is spending his days outdoors, cutting the brush on the property, carving out the land, building space for his daughters to camp and roast marshmallows. But this, this still isn't freedom. Not with an anklet it isn't, and not with an October trial hanging over him, and not with eight years lost to prison, and not with the crown still making him a monster, and not with the racism we can never make it out from, no matter where we go how far we run, whatever escapes, we engineer for ourselves. Thank you. I'm gonna just keep reading a bit through the book. So towards the beginning of the book, there's an essay called The Prison is Always With Us, and I wrote this book at Banff. And part of what the essay is about is also thinking about our own complicities in these systems, so we understand that, for example, in order to defund the police, we have to contend with the notion of where does the impulse to police come from? And that does not rest with the police force, it rests in us, in our notions of who belongs, in capitalism, in our idea of who belongs to the public, all of things which we have to actually contend with before we actually would have the ability to get rid of policing. If aliens came down tomorrow and zapped up every police force and destroyed the bricks of every prison, we would build new prisons and police, right? Businesses would get their own private security force, we see this in Detroit, actually, where there's like two Detroits, right? One where there's like no services, the black Detroit, and one where white people are able to pay for electricity and ambulances and policing, and they're able to do that because they're rich. So until we actually understand where our impulse to punish comes from, we will continue to rebuild and remake prisons and rebuild and make, remake the police because we haven't yet learned how to deal with conflict. We don't know how to hold each other accountable. I always say if we can't hold our friends accountable in our friend circles for rape, you know, like if we can't deal with rapists in our friend circles, how are we going to actually deal in a world without prisons, right? These are hard questions. So part of what this essay, The Prison is Always With Us, is about is thinking about this way that prisons are torn down and remade and come back and our own complicity in these systems. So I'm going to start reading just from the middle of this book of this essay. The works of prisoners are all around us. In my first week in Banff, submerged in pages filled with the voices of prisoners and deportees, I find out that Banff National Park was the site of an internment camp for enemy aliens during World War I. In the library, I find the book Park Prisoners by Bill Weiser about the prisoners who built Western Canada's national parks. I open the book at random to find the story of George Luca Budak, a Romanian internee who died by suicide on Christmas Eve, carving his stomach open with a razor and then slitting his throat. I read the passages with Jerry's voice layered over, telling me of loneliness at Christmas, of abandonment, of men going quietly to their cells and closing the door. These were not captured soldiers. The prisoners were mostly Ukrainian immigrants, constricted to break rocks and dig roads and cut trails. They were marched in chains at the point of bayonets, abused, starved, freezing. We bundle up for nature walks and hikes up the mountain. It is bitterly cold. Trying to picture what it would have felt like in a camp here is impossible. There is a masseuse on staff, and the artists get discounts. Some of the men were rounded up for losing their jobs due to growing wartime hysteria. Some refused to register. Some tried to cross the border to the United States. Reports at the time said the government was benevolent in their treatment toward the men. At the end of the war, many of those left in the camps were deported. For the rest, wages were withheld. There were all kinds of these camps in Canada, not just the Japanese internment camps in World War II or the camps in Canada's national parks in World War I, but during the Depression too. Citadel Hill in Halifax, Todd McCallum tells me, was a camp for unhoused men in the 30s. Conscientious objectors, particularly Mennonites, were another group rounded up and forced to work during World War II. Over and over again, the same stories. Undesirables, foreigners, the displaced, all rounded up and incarcerated on the excuse of security or necessity or useful labor or cleaning up. 
We build prisons, tear them down, forget the stories, and build another prison. There was Abdul Abdi, and after Abdul, there was Elmi, and the same thing happens over and over. And a hundred years ago, only kilometers down the road, a prison camp for other immigrants. The same fears about borders and safety and foreign and danger. There is a building here named for the transatlantic pipeline, a tribute to the oil money in this place, and I think cynically that a hundred years from now, that will be all there is, a landscape of prisons named for oil companies. It would be the least honest stance in the world to pretend these things dent our enjoyment. I might think about how Banff was built by prisoners while I'm eating my unlimited buffet in the Three Ravens restaurant, but that does not stop me from going back for dessert. I might recognize the incredible privilege I enjoy of writing here is because someone else died, or less starkly, because someone is working serving food at minimum wage. But beyond having the thought, what else do we do about it? We comfort ourselves with the acknowledgement, oh, prisoners, that's so sad. And then we keep on about our day. As D.H. Lawrence said, we've got to live, no matter how many skies have fallen. The truth is, all our pleasures, all our works are founded on people's suffering, both past and present. And the truth is, we put it out of our minds constantly. Even those I love dearly, locked away, I have thought on their conviction I would not get over the sorrow, but we get over and move along. Sorrow is not something we can hold in front of us. It slips away constantly. There are times my internal geography of Canada moves from prison to prison. When I move around the country with voices of prisoners in my ears, when landscape recalls drives out to remote prisons, just because it never appears on the signs does not mean the prison is not with us. There is a monument at the foot of Castle Mountain now for the internees, a statue with the word why written on it. Perhaps one day all prisons, all border camps, all airports where people were deported from, all roads where vans with chained prisoners were transported, perhaps all of those will one day be places people go to ask why, where they brush tears from their eyes, where they think of how brutal, how unfair things were in the past. But even if they were, I'm not naive enough to think there wouldn't be some new but same injustice, some other prison, some other safety, some other punishment. Hope, I say, and try to mean it. There's still hope. We'll find another way. Keep your head up. Be safe. Call me back soon. Talk later. It is three weeks until Christmas. Okay. I'm going to do a couple of more poems, and then I guess I'll shut up so that we can have time for Q&A. I actually don't usually read these out of the book, so I have to find the poems in the book for a change. So just give me a moment. Uh -huh, page 88. Normally I'd be reading off my phone, you know. All right. This is called uh, Police Brutality Bingo. It's a game that anyone can play. It's on at least three times a day from Florida to Toronto. It's Police Brutality Bingo. It's in both official tongues. Montreal cops got guns. Just tune into the news, any channel will do. Twitter on your Facebook page, and if black people don't want to engage, you can comment without an intro. Police brutality, bingo. So let's review the lingo, police brutality, bingo. There's so many ways you can win, as long as you have white skin. If you're ready, we can begin. Just fill the reasons in B1, must have run. I2, what did she do? N3, shouldn't sell CDs. G4, reach through the door. O5, it's their fault. They're not alive, bingo. They're not alive. He had something that looked like a knife. Shouldn't have carried the gun down the aisle. Shouldn't have played with the BB outside. Well, he didn't look like a child. You can play the columns or the rose police brutality, bingo. Well, he had a wide set nose. Shouldn't have worn those clothes. Shouldn't have worn that hoodie. Shouldn't have shown her ID. Shouldn't have kept her hands in sight. Shouldn't have asked for her rights. Was probably suicide. Shouldn't have been in that cell. The body cameras will tell. Oops, seems they were erased. Sorry, the footage misplaced. Shouldn't have reached for your phone. Whatever you did, you should have known. She must have done something the tape cut out. Benefit of the doubt, even if police were in the wrong, only idiots don't play along. Should have shown respect. What do you expect? And on and on it goes, police brutality, bingo. 
We can go for the whole card. The police job is so hard. Shouldn't have stolen cigars. Shouldn't have been in that car. He's been pulled over many times. Shouldn't have committed those crimes. I always do what I'm told and I'm stopped. Hashtag all lives matter. Hashtag not all cops. Should have fixed his tail lights. Shouldn't speed when you drive. If their parents had raised them right, it's their fault they're not alive. It's their fault they're not alive. Then misuse a Martin Luther King quote, police brutality, bingo. From the bottom of the card to the top. How dare you demand no cops? Just wait till you need to call. The number of violent cops is so small. It's not the United States. We don't have the same problem with race. Shouldn't be ruining my commute. Can't support you with that attitude. White people just want to have a conversation. Seems like you just want segregation. Seems like you're the real racist. Why can't you just quietly sit? It's not the place of the time. Why don't you address black crime? You shoot each other in Toronto. Police brutality, bingo. White people, you can teach your kids. It must be something that they did. There's always something you can prove. Did they reach or did they move? Were their hands up? Did they freeze? Were they on their back or knees? Well, then they're threatening. You know it's police brutality. Bingo. You can get both diagonals. Shouldn't be acting like animals. They're just trying to sue for the damages. His body was strong like a savage's. In the middle, it's a free square. Their criminal record goes there. It's always good for a smear. You can always rely on some fear. You can always call in a threat. Think how many squares you can get. He was reading suspiciously long. Must be doing something wrong. Just didn't look like they belong. Better call 911. Nothing to do with me though. Police brutality. Bingo. Whole family can join in the fun. You can pass your racism on and that's how the cycle runs. It's a job that's never done. You can hang your cards on the fridge. Free square. White privilege. You can put them back when you're bored. Turn off the news report. Put black people out of your mind until you're ready to play next time. That was such a long time ago. It's time to move on, you know, and that's how this whole thing goes. It's police brutality, bingo. Thank you. All right. I'm gonna read a couple more sections and then we'll go. I've talked a lot about dudes, like about the men, so I just really quickly wanna read a couple of sections from the woman and then I'll read one more thing and one last poem and then we'll all come up. Thank you for your time. I will say that I brought like 20 books. I didn't think there'd be this many people. And thank you, obviously, to St. Thomas, to Dr. Giwa for doing so much organizing work to pull people together. It doesn't just happen that people show up in a room. People do a lot of work to make that happen. So thank you to the department as well. But as a result, probably don't have enough books, but you can order them from Fernwood Press or also the King's Co-op Bookstore. Uh, please also order them. I know for a fact Paul has like 100 books. So if you want to get a book, the King's Co-op Bookstore in Halifax will have them. Firm Press, you can order them online as well. And hopefully that's it. All right. Uh, so I'll just read a couple of these sections and then... Okay, so this is from a section called Interludes. This part is called Gray Areas. The truth is we struggle with these questions every day. We wouldn't be human if we didn't. That complex work of humanity is so much a part of prison advocacy. We often don't talk about that struggle and reflection and doubt because we are speaking so urgently about issues we feel are important and because we want to speak strategically. And also, I think, because dealing with the gray areas is so complicating and when you're still trying to get people to see things like shackling a critically ill woman to her hospital bed is hard, bad or putting people in solitary confinement for four years is inhumane, you're still trying to deal with the most basic issues of prison justice. So talking about negotiating how you feel about horrific crimes or questioning yourself or the internal dialogues around why you do what you do can seem like it's introducing a harmful doubt because these are the crimes that make people support prisons and the ones that make people accuse. So you want these people running the streets? It's cases like this that convince people we need prisons and punishment is cathartic. So we try not to talk about them and talk about the easier ones. But advocacy isn't about being perfect. It's actually about these struggles and negotiating them and working them out. It's not just about the black and white cases and the cases everyone empathizes with, the stuff that we all agree upon. It's about challenging how we think and feel about the difficult issues and being honest with ourselves about those feelings. Um, this section, I'm just gonna scroll. Uh, all right, this is from a section called Equality. When I was allowed to go into the max unit to write with the woman, we would meet in a room used for school, programs, the library, and activities. One day I'm meeting with the woman one-on-one, -on -one and we don't have enough paper. 
We start writing on the whiteboard in the room instead. The woman I'm writing with tells me about how she was trafficked and held in a motel room for weeks, kept naked and drugged. She finally escaped. She described running through the lobby of the motel, barely knowing where she was. The cops gave her a few thousand dollars and put her on a plane back home. That was it. She told me she spent the money on drugs, and when she ran out, she robbed a pharmacy. She got five years, more than the men who kidnapped, raped, and abused her ever served. On the board in the room, she writes about running and about healing and hope. I tried to memorize the poem, to hold onto it before it was erased, but it's gone from me, like a shape moving indistinctly behind a heavy door. And one last thing from this section. This is called bus stops. Every so often when I'm waiting for the bus, a woman will come up to me smiling, and I look at her, and it's a woman I wrote with in the woman's prison, Nova Institution. We always hug, laughing and beaming at each other, the human contact and joy we were forbidden when we sat together at those glass tables, when even talking too much about your lives or any affection at all was cause for suspicion. One time I was waiting in the visiting area for the woman to come down, and I got up and looked through the books and games and magazines on the shelves with visiting families, and I found a sheet of paper. A mother had made a list with her children of what she would do when she got out. Order pizza, it said. Talk for as long as I want with no one listening. One of the entries said, walk, not in a circle. One of the women goes into a long meditation once on the phrase on the outs about how it can mean you're angry with someone, but then it also means what you hope for. I'll see you on the outs. On a hot summer day, I'm running up and down Citadel Hill, focused within myself. There's construction on the road around the hill, and a woman is there holding a sign. After a few repeats, when I get to the top, she comes over to me and asks me if I used to come to Nova. We chat for a moment at the top of the hill. A metaphor come to life. She has climbed this far. She made it out. I'll read one last section, one last poem. I'm trying to go fast, sorry. I just like have these ungraceful transitions. This is actually my favorite essay in the book. It's called We Gonna Be All Right. And this is a point where I'm talking myself back to life um, after many years of not getting jobs, of being rejected all over the place. Um, so this essay is really a call to myself, and I hope to those of you who do activism about finding our purpose. I'm not going to read from the beginning. I'll start here. People talk about self-care, but what can that mean when the people who care most deeply for you and the ones who you love in return are the people to whom you owe your labor? It isn't a burden to do this work. Not when the trust and solidarity and profound love you build by your commitment to each other are the reward. But still, when the calls from segregation come in the evenings, it means there's no going to movies, or out to dinner, or even watching a whole show on Netflix. And that's the work that won't get a tenured job. That's the work that puts pain in your body and takes years off your life. But when M calls me and tells me I sound down, and I tell him I don't know if I'll have a job next year, he says, I get a welfare check every month. Let me send you that. Someone like you should never have to ask for help. Nobody else, not the heads of departments, not the colleagues and friends, nobody else has offered everything they have like that. This is why we answer the phone evening after evening. I think often about Rocky Jones's portrait in the law school at Dalhousie. I knew Rocky, knew at the end of his life he was still having to scramble for cash. The institutions that spend tens of millions on buildings could have funded a chair for Rocky Jones if they had wanted to. If they valued him, they could have done it. All the years of fighting white supremacy until his heart literally gave out inside him, the institutions to which he gave so much could have made a place for him to live out his life in dignity. They chose not to. And the same universities that couldn't spend a few thousand to make sure Rocky was taken care of display his picture now that he is safely dead. Desmond Cole says to me, we may not be religious, but what we do is like a religious act. We imagine and work toward a better world, but the heaven we are trying to make is here on earth. And while we are living here and struggling, we are in hell. 
but heaven and hell are the same place for us. So every day we wake up in hell and we have to do our best to enter heaven. We have to sacrifice for that. And we have to pay the price for that. We don't hold anything back in this work. Not savings, not our tongues that get us labeled troublemakers, not even our tears, although we push them back and get up the next morning and keep fighting on. Because someone has to buy the groceries, put the clothes in the prison boxes, pay the gas for visits. Somebody has to hold the hands in court and call the lawyer and visit the jail and take the call from the suicide cell. And somebody has to stand up in the meetings and in the places of power and at the panels and even the parties to call relentlessly on those with power to do more, to end it. And when you stand in that love and solidarity and rage, you can't expect to have the bills paid. You can't expect to have the comfort of the world too. You have to make your choices. Sometimes I lie in bed and think about the books I should have written, the papers I could have published, the poems and articles and chapters I didn't give my time to. And everyone tells me I wouldn't be lying here if I had just written those things. But then I ask myself, which life would I exchange for that book? Whose life was worth less than a chapter? And I know I wouldn't choose differently, just as nobody would choose differently. Not if you knew the life that was in front of you, that you had the power to hold and sustain. We are the living archive, I remind myself. And there is no tenured position, no degree, no qualification that can give me what is worth more than one life. It is not that I save them. It is their trust and care sustains and nurtures me. That every day when I despair, when I don't know how I can pick up and rebuild again, when I don't know how I can fight these fights without sickening and dying from it, it is their voices that remind me over and over who I am and why I do this work. And these are my instructions to the people around me. If I die before you, Make sure those who loved me and whom I loved are the people at my funeral. Scatter my ashes outside the prisons of this province so I can haunt them forever. Don't use my name for whack shit and don't let the institutions that wouldn't love me in life take hold of me in death. If I die violently, remember that I hated prisons and honor me. I'm not imagining my death. These are my expressions of my commitment to the living to my life and the life of others, to the sacrifice that isn't a sacrifice, but a sacrament, a blessing. Thank you. I'm going to read one last poem. Before I do, I just want to remind you that you can join New Brunswick Grassroots. Um, they're organizing together against some of this funding of policing, the expansion of the prison. Do go check out their socials, New Brunswick Grassroots, NB Grassroots. Um, so they're doing good work. They're trying to create an alliance, obviously, across the Atlantic provinces as well, so that we're all sharing knowledge across the Atlantic. So I do encourage you to check that out. And one last poem, and then we'll all come up. All right. Sorry. Scrolling is hard in this book. Okay. This is the final poem. It's the last poem in the book. It's called Good Night Jail. It's based upon Good Night Moon. Does anybody know the poem, Good Night Moon? Yes. Margaret Wise Brown, which turns out to be 75 years old this year, so I chose well on my publishing date. In a provincial jail, there's a little room with a toilet and a sink and a smell of mildew and a slit of a window with a sliver of the moon and a radio on a shelf playing a tune and a metal cot and a metal slot and a night that's either too cold or too hot and an officer in the spot by the stairs and three more guards sitting in chairs and the shadow of the laws that put people in there. And the eye of the camera watching you sitting and a photocopied picture of your mother and children and a heart with a hole for the loved ones you're missing and restless dreams where you wake up shivering and a door with a lock 
and a window with bars, and a corner of the sky showing just one star, and a comb and a brush, and a toilet that won't flush, and a guard on his rounds, ordering. Hush. So good night, room, like a little tomb. Good night, window, barely showing the moon. Good night, laws that aren't changing soon. Good night, radio. Good night, news. Good night, cot. Good night, slot. Good night, down in solitary where the world forgot. Good night, sheets tied up in a knot. Good night, bad dreams and regretful thought. Good night, clanging doors and the camera shut. Good night, locks. Good night, clocks. Good night, countdown to the day you get out of the box. Good night, mildew. Good night, mold. Good night, lights on all night down in the hole. Good night, heart with its little hole. Good night, heat. Good night, cold. Good night, foam mattress. Good night, comb. Good nights to the crumpled picture of home. Good night, dripping sink and toilet that won't flush. And good night to the officers ordering. Hush. Good night, patrols. Good night, stare. Good night, outside. Good night, air. Good night, love. Good night, care. Good night, prisoners everywhere. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I guess I'll call everybody forward. I also want to shout out Martha Painter and Ben Perryman in the audience. They're in the book. Ben Perryman's amazing work as a lawyer. Martha's work on reproductive justice, so two co-conspirators. I guess we'll all just come to the stage. OK, perfect. Sorry, I think I took too long. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Jones. I'm quite certain that a number of your words resonated with our students. Uh, several of the stories you've told, these long journeys that individuals take through criminal justice systems, it would largely make up the curriculum of um, several of our courses. So I know there will be good questions coming from students who took those courses. The downside, yes, I was going to say, the downside to St. Thomas is I can start calling people out by name. But. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Maya Benson. I'm a first year crim student. Um, I guess my question is, as a young woman in criminology who aspires to go into law school eventually, what are things that I can do now in my life to ensure that change comes to the policing system and also to the legislative system? Do we want to go down the line? OK. Um, do you want me to start? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that, first of all, it's really important, especially for young people. I think we have to understand that all the work we do is incremental. We imagine a world we want. We think about it. We work towards it. But we know, as I said, it's not happening in our lifetime, right? Um, and that can, I think, bring us to a state of despair if we aspire to something and then we say, oh, but you know, it's not changing. So I think it's actually really important that we set ourselves really achievable steps and goals. So what can you do right now if you want to go into law school? Um, everything is simple from, you know, writing letters to getting involved in, um, like, community organizations. So I, you know, if you have Elizabeth Fry out here or John Howard, you can, Seven Step is certainly out here and you can work with them. Seven Step does, a, like, self-help for people within prison. So it's a group of people who used to be in prison and then community members, and it's about building those networks. Um, you can definitely also think about what the legal system is and ways of kind of uh, our own complicities in those systems. So that means understanding settler colonialism. It means understanding the lands we're on and how we're here and how we all participate in that, which might mean things like thinking about how we consume differently, thinking about the environment differently. Um, so there's all kinds of things. What I'm saying is that all of these systems are interconnected, and we don't have to go out every day and like protest outside of prison, or you know, we're not always going to be mobilizing in the way we were 20, in 2020, but we can always be organizing. And that, I think, takes place where we are. So 
criminal justice discussion group among students where you read different literature, like feminist abolitionist literature, and discuss it together and think about it. Um, those are all things that you can do in small ways. So I'll pass it on for other people. I mean, ten, you've been organizing here, so you can probably not, and be grassroots, you know, join that, uh, which is doing a lot of organizing here. So I think the main thing is to just um, set ourselves steps that we can take, understanding that um, we don't always have to be out there in the biggest way. Like those little steps you make in our communities and families and places where we are are steps that help us build to justice. And I'll send it on. Yeah, for uh, what can you do right now? I'm a strong advocate of widening of the scope. So I would always just suggest reading the history, especially in criminology and legal systems. I know I've been going down many wonderful pathways, reading Robin Winks, Dr. Armani Whitfield, and just on abolitionists in the 1800s here in New Brunswick and how they turned the tide of slavery and all of this enslaved individuals that ran to the court system to demand their freedom is really an interesting case actually because they got their freedom by proving that you couldn't hold someone as property. See, when the enslaved were linked to a piece of property, they had to go and then go to these judges and say, well, technically, you know, I'm a human being. And it was either a friendly judge who would say, yes, that's right, you were not, or an unfriendly judge who had to prove they were property, which they couldn't if they didn't have any documents. And this happened all the time in the early history in New Brunswick. So I would say if you are looking to be a lawyer and to get friendly with these systems, dig deep into the rot of the history of these systems to really see how they're built. Don't stop at 10, 20 years ago. Dig into the centuries of the legal system and see what you find there. And I think I'll just echo uh, many of the points that has already been shared. I, I would add that um, it's really also important to be crystal clear about what your commitment is to the work that you want to do. I think that's really going to serve you as a guidepost to the actions that you end up taking. I think having a good sense of the systems that you're trying to intervene in is equally important. Um, the manners in which we take activism also needs to change. Uh, there isn't just one, a singular way of activism. Activism can also be in the form of writing poetry. It could be in the form of doing research that actually informs the particular issue that you are writing about or talking about or agitating about. But it can also be actually you know, going into the spaces where those institutions are actually working to meet with them, have a conversation with them about the work that they're doing and how it's having impact on, directly on the communities that you're members of. Right, and to see how that dialogue can actually move issues forward. Right, so again, echoing both what um, Dr. Jones and Tendui just said, you know, just diversify the ways you engage with those um, spaces, and I think that will serve you well going forward. Thank you. I did have one more question, if that's okay. Um, I recognize that I'm a privileged white woman, and I was wondering if there are ways that I can work towards helping to better amplify people's voices that are indigenous or people of color that have experienced these things, if that makes any sense. Yeah, well, I think the first thing, Audre Lorde has a really great essay um, called The Uses of Anger. One of the things she says is that guilt and shame are not useful either for our own emotions nor are they useful in movement. So we don't need people to be like, oh my God, I'm white. <laughs> That's so terrible. Um, you know, like, obviously reflecting on our power and privilege is a necessary act for all of us at all times in how we're situated. I am free. People in prison are not. That is a fundamental difference. I speak from a different place that they do. But also we can't let this sense of shame and guilt, um, like, just become a kind of end in itself that we just say, oh, you know, I'm... Because the question is we need to get out there and we need to undergo work. And we're all going to make mistakes when we do that work. Um, I don't think activists talk enough about the mistakes we've made. Um, we make all kinds of mistakes. We are not perfect people. We conflict with each other. We have egos. All these things happen. Um, so I think it's also like asking yourself, where am I called? Where am I needed? So there's so many ways, and Dr. Gia was saying this, like sometimes we need people to pick up the elders and drive them. We need people to um, 
make sure that people who have disabilities are able to participate in our events and we're not just running events where everyone has to go stand in the cold and some people can't do that. So we can rethink that. Um, sometimes it means like providing resources or a platform and stepping back. Sometimes we're asking people, we need you to step forward. So I think it's really listening and saying, what am I being asked in this moment? Sometimes I'm being asked to be present. Sometimes I'm just needed in the background and it may be exactly, as you said, amplifying something, whether that's like sharing something on social media or helping somebody to edit a document or um, like going and doing the photocopying or whatever it is. There's so many different jobs, but I think we just do it with an open heart. We come, the best allies or comrades, if we want to put it, co-revolutionaries I've worked with are people that have just given like what they have in that moment and what is needed without too much sort of like angst about it. Like, they just are like, okay, I'm a lawyer. I'm being called to do pro bono work. I can do that work. I'm going to work together with the people that need me. I'm going to work now. Or I'm, you know, I have this expertise right now. I can provide that. So I think um, just asking yourself, what do I have? What is being asked of me? And then really listening to that. And sometimes, like I said, it can mean be behind the scenes. And sometimes people are asking you, like, we need you to come stand here. We need to do this. So um, all activism, I would say it's 90% listening and 10% not taking no for an answer. So. I don't know if you guys have other comments. Yeah, I would just add that. I think that also beginning from a point of humility to also recognize that you're never going to show up consistently at the same time that people need you to show up. Um, it's a difficult um, question to also answer, particularly because of the fact that you know there is a level of um, disconnection between the ways in which white people manifest their powers and how they actually utilize it. Um, we talk a lot about liberal white feminism and the ways in which they also, you know, take up their powers or they don't take up their powers for whatever you know, interest that it's serving. Um, so I think you know, recognizing that you know, you're not gonna be necessarily always showing up the way people need you to show up and being, being okay with that. But I think the difficult things that you need then to do is to step up in terms of how do you then make those changes um, on an individual level to be able to then kind of manifest that outward, right? I think it's recognizing that you're a human being, you're not gonna um, show up the way people need you to show up all the time. And once you recognize that, then you, you, you can do better. Like, you know, you recognize your flaws and then you can move forward from there. Perfect, thank and you. And don't take things personally, too. We all have to, like, you know, like if somebody's saying you're doing this thing now that's racist or ableist or take that breath. It's not, nobody's saying you're a bad person. Nobody's saying that you're not worth anything. No one's saying the entire work of your life is shit. They're just saying, in this moment, this thing you are doing is harmful and we all need to learn to take that breath, to listen, and then just... Let ourselves be accountable, be humble, and then apologize and move on, you know? So I think that's a very difficult thing because when we're confronted, we hear, like, you're a terrible person, you're bad. Like, all these narratives come and we get very defensive and then we want to defend ourselves. So I think it's just really important when we hear these things to take a breath, to really think about what is being said to me and then, you know, have the grace to respond, understand that people are actually offering us something in that moment in helping call us in, right? So I think that's helpful. I'm not saying I'm great at it, but it's helpful. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, I have a question. I have two questions, actually. Um, so I, I work for um, the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Societies, so I'm glad that you shouted it out. Um, I'll, um, if anyone wants to volunteer, we are looking for volunteers. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and um, my question is, how do you work um, with somebody who has different politics than you, but is in kind of this world of um, defund slash abolish slash reform. Like how do you find commonalities and how do you work together? Because that's something that I personally find really challenging as an abolitionist is working with people who um, are like almost there, but not quite there. <laughs> um, and my next question um, is where do you find hope? Because I find that this work can be very depressing um, and challenging. So where do you find that hope and where do you find like that kind of drive to keep going? Yes, I'm always starting. <laughs> um, okay, so with the first one, yeah, I mean, I think, I actually find coalition work can be really helpful in this and prison work is a great example because, you know, you have people that are like black and indigenous that are coming in from understandings of racism and colonialism and approaching it that way. You have people that are coming in that are like lawyers or people that have analyzed the system. And then you have families that, you know, might not share your political background at all. Like they can be a conservative family from like Southern Ontario or something who then had a loved one die in prison and have come into this movement. And we have all kinds of conflicts. 
You know, we have all kinds of ways that people don't agree with each other, that people say, why are you guys always talking about race? Like, my sister was white and she died. You know, and we have to work that out because we can't just throw those families away and say, well, you don't agree with my politics, so I'm not going to fight for your loved one. So we actually have to get in that space together and argue and love each other and, like, listen to each other. And change does happen. People that three years ago were, like, mad that we were talking about race, I saw on social media, you know, later saying, like, we need to understand that indigenous people need to lead this work, right? So people will get there. So I think we do need to have a lot of grace with us in spaces, with each other in spaces where we're trying to do coalition work together. I think that's really important, which also means, like, being willing to deal with conflict and really figuring out how to negotiate with ourselves and, like, what is a line too far for me? What can I, like, what do I need to stand on? What can I let go? You know, these are all conversations we have. Um, but then the second piece is for like really tight work, I work in a crew, like we, you know, we have people that we really trust and how we've built trust is we talk all the time. So we talk everything out, we're on the phone like eight hours a day when we're doing like, you know, I talk about campaigns in this book like the deportation of Abdul Abdi, Elmi. We were like on the phone 12 hours, 15 hours a day because to trust each other in this work, we have to know each other. So you can't just jump into organizing with someone you know nothing about and then do this like really personal work and think that you're not going to fight because you don't even know like what someone's emotional register is, like what people require. So I think, remember organizing is human work. And to do that, we have to eat together, we have to joke together, we have to be honest with each other, we have to play together, all of those things so that when we come together to do this kind of work, we know each other, we know how people react, we know what we need from each other. So don't treat organizing like a job, you know, it, it, we have to, I think, really get to know each other. So also, like, how are we playing together in this space? How are we sharing together in this space? How are we sharing up for each other and there for each other? I think that helps build stuff. In terms of hope, uh, I mean, we win all the time. You know, we have some really bad losses, but we also win. Um, you know, it can be really hard to sustain yourself. Um, you know, there's times where I've been completely devastated. There's times where you certainly despair. And I talked about in that last piece I read to you that, you know, when we give out our love and care, it comes back to us and there's hope there. Um, you know, the small things that we can do for each other, I think we have to keep an eye on that. I think that, you know, neoliberalism wants us to believe there's no way out. They're in our phone, they're everywhere, there's no getting around them. So we just have to understand that we do work together and that, um, you know, we see those small steps. So again, like, dream big, except small, <laughs> you know, like in terms of your own kind of victories. And again, like, don't let organizing just be about, like, the moment. It, if you can't be a human being within it and you can't um, lean on your friends and you can't cry together and you can't say, fuck this together and you can't, you know, talk about the people that are making your life miserable together, then you also won't find hope together. So I think it's a very human piece as well. And now the rest of you can talk. Uh, thank you for taking all of the answers, Dr. L. Uh, I would say for how to deal with people in conflict with you is always start with yourself. If you really pour a lot of love into yourself and you go to these conversations ready, I think you can endure the friction you consistently face when people are saying something that you feel is wrong. and find a way that everyone can win. My personal activism philosophy is ev everybody can win, even this event, because is gonna sell some books, Professor Giwa is going to talk about his research, St. Thomas University is gonna look good, the New Brunswick Black Artist Alliance is gonna get their name out. Find a way everybody wins, but you can only do that if you are centered in yourself and you come to the table and as Dr. L said, be ready for the friction. If, if you can't take the friction, it's going to put you in a place where you can't even love or care for anything. So really, building and maintaining that relationship with yourself, my thing I always say is, take yourself out for a date, list all the things you love to do, a bath, your favorite food, what's your favorite CD you listen to? And you just give yourself a whole day where you run down that whole list of things. And I promise you, on the next day, you will be able to endure nightmarish conflict with a smile on your face. So that's how to deal with, you know, differing opinions. Hope, that's the easiest question. L said it too, 
eat some food with your friends. I know my organizing team, we go once a month, sometimes twice a month, where we just hold potlucks. And that's how we hold our meetings. We just all bring meals, we sit down, we eat, we talk, we laugh. We get down to business, we talk about what we're gonna do, what these events are going to be able to help us, how we get them to the communities, and then we go off on our separate ways, but always, as Elle said, do not separate your activism from your humanity. Like, the goal is there are no strangers. Everyone's your friend. That's the goal. So if that's our goal, you gotta be able to share food, break bread, just eat and chat as often as you can with amazing people that you like, and sooner or later you'll find that all the people you know have a little bit of amazing in them that grows with your understanding. Well said, Tandui. Um, very quickly, I would just add that um, for me, I feel like I come from a school of thought that believes in critical thinking and critical questions. So always asking the difficult questions of why is it that you desire for other folks to also share similar sentiments as you do? Why is it that you desire them to come to your side of the equation, right? I think that there's strength in diversity of thoughts and perspectives, and I think that really envisions the ways in which we move forward on any particular issue. So I think celebrating and also relishing the fact that people have diversity of perspective is really, really important to the kind of movement that we're doing. Um, I think in terms of hope, um, it's really difficult work that we do. And even within communities, racialized communities, you know, you would think that a lot of the solidarity that we would necessarily want to see within those spaces is this. But the reality is that they don't because some of the stuff that my other compatriots have been talking about around finding communities where you belong and so on. It's not the case that you find that solidarity and community in those spaces as well. So then you, as an individual who's a member of the racialized community, are also kind of like, you know, still, still being excluded from that community. So how do you then find hope to continue to do the work, and the work that you're doing, right? Perhaps sometimes you need to look outside of those communities to find those individuals and groups that would welcome you in and that you can begin to develop and cultivate those kind of relationships. And they, sometimes they don't even look, they're not members of your own racialized communities, right? They're from outside, right? And that can also instill a sense of, you know, um, belonging, a sense of hope that the work that you're doing is valuable, is important, even though that might not necessarily be coming from your own communities of culture, culture um, color, right, or racialized communities. So it's, again, just looking broadly beyond just the nucleus communities that you may be identifying yourselves with. But also, it's okay to cut a motherfucker off, too. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, preach, preach. <laughs> like, it, honestly, like, don't spend a lot of time on toxic energy. If something just doesn't work, cut. You know, you don't have to. Not everybody gets along, and that's okay. There's times when we strategically come together. We don't have to love each other. I can hate you, and sometimes we have a common cause. Come together for that, part ways. It's okay. Sorry. Um, I was wondering, you brought up social workers as having a cause for uh, police defunding, or as you put it, relocation of the money. Um, but given that social workers have their own history being agents of the state, I was wondering what you see social workers uh, play, part to play in this fight. That's a, that's a beautiful question to be asking. I would argue that I think social work has really uh, let its guard down in terms of actually how it engages with a lot of discussions that we've been having related to social justice, related to police defunding, abolition. Like our voice really haven't been necessarily felt um, I consider myself to be a forensic social worker, so a lot of the work that I do actually interfaces between legal systems, criminal justice system, and also bringing in perspective from social work to actually ground those work. Um, but we've been missing from, from the conversation, and I think it's really, really important that both at uh, educational level, we're actually preparing future social workers to be able to engage with the diversity and the complexities of the communities that they're actually working with. And that also includes institutions like policing. Um, when I'm talking about how we engage with police organizations, um, how I got my start in this work is actually working with the Ottawa Police Services in Ottawa. And I did a lot of work related to racial profiling and uh, of you know, visible minorities, indigenous, uh, indigenous people, racialized minorities within that, within that spaces. And it's really just understanding both the practice of policing as an institution, but also trying to understand the realities that 
you know, racialized communities, indigenous communities, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and trying to bring those two entities together to be able to understand how we move this conversation forward. So social work, I personally think, is actually at an interesting spot and location to be able to intervene and bring that lens of the work that we do to those discussions, right? I don't see why we are not, you know, um, well placed to be able to do that. And for me, that's been a, 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 a serious concern of mine in terms of how social work has kind of just reneged from engaging with institutions because of the fact that, you know, of the historical pieces that you're talking about, with the scoop and, you know, their complacement with, um, you know, residential schooling and so on and so forth, child welfare and, and all of that, right? But I still see, talking about hope, that there is hope for social work that we're gonna begin to actually do some of those heavy lifting and critical work that needs to be done. Um, hi, my name is Faye. I'm from Bear River First Nation of Nova Scotia. And as living in an indigenous community, I have witnessed a lot of injustice of indigenous youth being brought into the justice system when they actually belong in homes and haven't committed any crimes. I currently know someone in my community who is going through a $40,000 lawsuit against the system for being put in the system with no crime. And that actually happens a lot, and it can be compared to the residential school um, situation. So I feel like defunding the police can be based a lot on we use the system for things the system does not even need to be used for. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I agree, 100%. Um, so what you're talking about, too, is that how much resources is put into punishment, how many resources are put into various systems, including like removing indigenous kids from families, including the mass incarceration rates, like nearly half now of all federally incarcerated prisoners are indigenous women, and 90 plus percent of them are victims of trauma and sexual assault and physical assault, and the place of them is not prison. Um, the place of them is within community and within healing. Um, I mean, you know more than I do because you live in a community where you see it all the time. And so the question is, what would you do? And you can answer this maybe. If you had money in your community, the kinds of money that had been stripped out of indigenous lands and indigenous resources, what would you say that you need in your community? Um, I think we can start talking about how we help our children when we can suffice for ourselves because right now we don't even have water. Um, our schools, we have schools that still need to be built let alone the ones that are already built have water damage in the ceilings. We, they're not suitable. Like we just have too many issues to deal with before we can deal with how we punish people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You said it, so I mean, mm -hmm. there you go from this. Okay, in the interest of getting us to breaking bread, I think we'll use this as our last question. Okay. Uh Oh, that's a little too loud. Yeah, my voice is very loud. So before I get into this question on the topic of grassroots activism, I would like to bring to attention something that's near and dear to me that's happening next week. Am I allowed to? So in 2020, during the height of the pandemic, the New Brunswick government put a 3.8% cap on the rent hike. Now they're planning on getting rid of it, and on the 26th at 1 p.m., the New Brunswick Tenants' Right Coalition, I believe that's what they're called, are holding a rally. If you give a single shit about people who have to worry about rent, you should be there. It is a rally, and it's going to be calling for the government to extend the rent cap. So that's just very interesting, and it's something I really, really fucking think we should be caring about. All right, and then for the actual question, there was something that you mentioned, uh, Dr. Giwa, I believe it is? You were saying that in regards to the question of how much to defund the police, it was something used uh, similarly sort of like in a classroom, no rules and way too many rules are equally as destructive. And if we apply that to the question of defunding the police, where do you believe the healthy middle ground exists? Like where do you believe we can find a happy middle ground? Or we still have law, we still have law enforcement, but they're neutered. They won't be able to you know, commit the same atrocities without being held accountable for it. Thanks for your question. I think for me, the biggest issues that I see with the defunding the policing discourse is the polarization of the discussion itself. Mm. That 
we are essentially being asked to consider the possibility of an either or situation, which I don't necessarily buy into. Mm, right. I consider the possibility of an and or conversation that it is possible, and to going back to the uh, young lady's uh, question there, that we can still hold police accountable for the ways in which they engage or they don't engage with racialized indigenous communities. And I think that there are mechanisms that we can actually de deploy to be able to make sure that we're actually getting the outcomes that we desire. At the same time, the vision that we've been asked to think about in terms of the future of what defunding would look like, I think leaves a lot of questions still unanswered. And I think for folks who are also on the, on the spectrum of supporting the idea of defunding the policing, I think that there's still probably unresolved questions for folks, but people are not just asking those questions because perhaps the space haven't been created to ask those kind of questions that needs to be asked. So I suggest I'm proposing the idea, the possibility of actually engaging the different constituents that needs to be engaged in these conversations so that we can begin to identify you know, what it is that police are doing, what it is that they should not be doing, and let's have conversation about that. And if that requires that we need to, you know, detask policing from some of the work that they're doing to or reallocate some kind of fundings to community groups or community associations, then those are things that we need to do. But that also requires the police being at the table. Um, so this polarity of like, you know, either or, Two camps is one that I think that we need to be really pushing back against and to be asking critical questions around why we need to be going in that direction. Hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. So I think I'll close the question period. I want to take this opportunity to thank each of our speakers with a small gift, which is a framed and portable version <laughs> of tonight's poster. So I'll just... Now, as a way of formally closing the event, we do have a reception outside. I want you to come and eat, eat all the food I've ordered. But just before we do that, we're going to hear uh, a closing poem from Tondaway, and then Migmahan will bring a close to um, tonight's event. So um, I'm going to turn the stage over to Tondaway for a closing poem, and then Migmahan will come up right afterwards to close out tonight. Wow, look at that. Okay. So fancy. There you go, Gary. Get a picture of that. <laughs> I really enjoyed the level of complexity that we shared in this conversation tonight. The fact that we talked about hard truths that exist in opposition to one another and how we can find the middle ground. I think it's important that we don't downplay the complexity of these conversations when we need to bring as many different stakeholders to the table as possible to even have an accurate sense of what we are dealing with. And uh, anyway, I really enjoyed Dr. L's saying, we are the living archives. And it tickles me that the things that she was saying in her book is kind of what I was jiving to when I was writing these poems. So uh, here is one that I have just called Justice. <clears throat> is there a soul in this room that has never experienced suffering? Have we become so distracted that we've forgotten the mistakes we've made? How hard is it to believe that the love from friends and family kept us from those handcuffs in prison beds? Is it too much to believe that love cures suffering? Invest in opening your heart to people, 
not locking them away. We've done that with ourselves each and every day. There's emotions we've caged and trauma we've incarcerated. This is the message they don't want me revealing. We hide our problems in prisons, not just people. We hide our pain in those prisons. We hide our profits in those prisons. And when we erect that $32 million prison, we will lock our dreams inside of it. But I have a dream, a vision, that our flaws won't stain us as failures, that our mistakes won't take us to those concrete cages. I have a vision that the richness of our humanity, those mountains of gold in all your souls, never gets broken down, commodified, and sold. I have a dream that the value of your identities inspires us to build intimacy, not iron bars, not monster trucks hungry with hate and armored with apathy. No, my dream is of a justice that loves us, and that means we have to share our smiles, our tears, fears, hopes, and yes, even our anger. So I hope you'll start tonight and make a new friend for me. Let's learn more local names instead of distant celebrities. Let's see if we can turn the entire city of Fredericton into one big family. Oh, we'll fight and we'll scream, we'll laugh and we'll play, but as long as we communicate, I think we'll be okay. We've got plenty of work to do, but together, we'll be okay. Kisuk, a web you lolly at Dandeligan Muyat Kiskuk, Dandeligan a how glue swahan, a Dandeli Banadu we egg and gum lamanina, Dandeli Kisuli egg, Ukwayu, Juadu egg, Ukwayu di, a Dandeli Uldel sult, Dandel a Pegisuluk sultig, Pegisul tultig, Dandeli Uldel, Del sulti desco. I wanted to acknowledge uh, in my language uh, what has happened this evening and um, how you've brought us into a, uh, a space that is uh, deeply penetrating uh, for coming from an indigenous grandmother uh, and uh, the stories that are being told in our communities. The, um, and what, we, what, what I feel in a summary of how what I've heard tonight really penetrated deeply for me, but I want to also uh, remind everyone that, uh, that we have a uh, treaty obligation and that we in the elders that I sit with in our communities. We will continually call on Canada and its provinces to obey their law. And, in, and if that is the first step that the Canadians can do in honoring the treaties of our homeland for, that we are all part of, uh, that will t be the first step towards honoring every person 
on our sacred lands. It's about honoring the Constitution, the Canadian law. And I believe that is founded on our spiritual beliefs. When those treaties and when those laws were created, they were created in the witness, having the witness of our ancestors and the creator of all. Thank you so much for uh, the medicine, the big medicine that you've brought. And I got deeply moved by it. And I will hold that. I will bring it into my bundle and I will echo forward your voices and continually commit to walk a good way, to be in a good mind. I feel all you have to be so good. I'm sitting all among all my relations. Thank you, everyone, for your attention um, and everyone for their words and thoughts. So let's go eat. <laughs>